Hi everyone, welcome to the uh, Scottish Beavers community event. Uh, we've got quite a few of you registered today, we've got about 60 odd people, so I'm just watching the number of attendees uh, slowly trickling up once it seems to have come to a set uh, and level point we'll get going. Okay, that seems like seems like uh, everyone's just about joined us. Um, so first of all, um, welcome uh, along to, to to this meeting, which is the as I say, is the Scottish Beavers Community Event. Um, we are really pleased to to to, to see you all here, um, and hope you uh, hope you find this of interest. Uh, just to stress, uh, if you have any questions for any of the panelists, please add those to the to the Q and A. Uh, panel that you'll see at the the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those uh, towards the end of the event. And just a quick reminder also that we're going to be recording uh, this evening's event, and we'll make that available online afterwards. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Sarah Robinson, uh, who's going to uh, do the official welcome. Um, yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. We're delighted so many people have taken an interest um, and it's great to have you all here, although disappointing not to be in Napdale ourselves, of course. Uh, we've got a variety of talks for you this evening um, from various people and then there'll be an opportunity at the end for you to ask your questions. But please feel free, as Rory suggested, to put those questions in the question and answer um, panel at the bottom of your screens. You should be able to click on that and access how you type in your questions for us. We won't take questions after each talk. We'll gather the questions right at the end and answer them all then. So if you have got a question for a specific speaker, please do put their name or their organisation at the front of the question so we know who to direct that to. Um, without further ado, I shall pass on to the first speaker this evening, who is Helen Taylor from the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, and she's going to give us a summary of this autumn's fieldwork for the project. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so yes, my name is Dr Helen Taylor and I'm from the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. I'm the Conservation Programme Manager uh, for RZSS and also the Field Manager for the Scottish Beavers Project. And I'll have seen some of you before at the events that we've had in Napdale. And today I'm just going to be giving you a summary of the latest and indeed the final uh, survey, the six monthly survey that we've done in Napdale, which was in September of this year. And it was a little bit of a different survey. Uh, this year has been a little bit different for everybody. So I'm going to go through some of the results of the survey, some of the exciting things uh, that we found and sort of what we know about um, the Napdale beaver population moving away um, from the end of this year. Uh, so yes, this year's survey was a little bit different um, and obviously the reason for that was because of COVID-19. We actually managed to do two surveys this year. So we did do the survey in March and we did do the survey in September. Uh, the survey in March was, the timing of that was literally just before the first major lockdown came in. And so that survey did get cut short. Um, the survey in September, we were able to do the whole thing. But in both cases, we took a lot of extra precautions because of the pandemic. So we reduced our field team right down from what it would normally be. Uh, in September, we were bound by the two household rules. So um, we're very fortunate in that my flatmate is a field ecologist and uh, Dr. Helen Sen uh, was able to come on the team and bring her husband as a volunteer as well, who's also a handy outdoors person. So we could conduct that, that field survey in a, a safe way, maintaining social distancing between our houses, but also making sure that we weren't coming into contact with anybody in the area uh, without any kind of safe social distancing in place. We take measures like bringing all of our groceries with us and things like that so that we're not having to bob into local shops and just minimizing the risks for everyone. So we took this very, very seriously uh, with this week's, uh, this, this year's survey, but also making sure that we could still get the job done and collect all the data that we needed to collect. 
So what were we looking for when we're out there? Well, you know, you've probably seen me talk about the field sign survey a little bit before. Um, beavers can be quite tricky to track themselves um, and we don't have radio, radio tags on any of the beavers in Napdale. So the main way we track them, what we're quite lucky is that, you know, beavers are not subtle. So wherever they go, they're going to leave signs. And these are the kind of activity signs that we're looking for. So it might be feeding signs and gnawing signs on trees. It might be beaver sticks where they've taken all the bark off. Um, it could be a dam. It could be um, a lodge. It could just be a big field of bracken that's been completely decimated because they've taken it all for their bedding. So what we do is uh, we survey every single loch and waterway in the, in the Napdale study area and we mark and uh, GPS point every single beaver sign we see that we judge to be made within the past six months. And when we're looking for recent signs, what we're looking for is sort of bright yellow or bright orange wood. Um, if it's sort of faded to like a brown or a gray, that means it's an older sign, we've probably tracked it before. And in terms of the dams and the lodges that we, they tend to stick around for a longer time, we're looking to see whether there's fresh material on the dam or the lodge um, and whether that appears to be maintained and in use to give us an idea of what's going on. So what did we find in this, this six monthly survey. Uh, what we've got here is a map of the Napdale area and every single dot on the map is um, a beaver activity sign. So it might be a dam, it might be a lodge, those tend to be the yellow and green dots, all the red dots are feeding signs or where trees have been taken down, things like that. Um, it's worth noting that we don't do full surveys of Kulivar and Barn Luskin because Heart of Argyle Wildlife Organization, who you'll hear through from later, do such a great job of taking care of those areas and keeping an eye on them that we don't really need to anymore. Um, but just because there's no dots on Kulivar, that trust me, there is lots of activity on Kulivar and there's, there's a big family that's still very active there, but not so much on Barn Luskin, interestingly. Um, but you can see that there are dots throughout the Napdale study area at this point. Um, and most, most of the major locks are occupied by beavers and they're coming out into some of the waterways as well. So some of the exciting things, the highlights that we saw um, in this survey. Uh, the first thing I'd like you to draw your attention to is two clusters of points, uh, one on the actual islands of, of the Fairy Isles and one down on the peninsula um, into opposite Aknamara into Loch Sween. Um, so what we did was took a canoe out to these sites just to check just to have a look, see if there was any beaver sign there, just on the off chance it's the last survey, let's have a look, let's have a crack. And we found it. Uh, so uh, this is Helen Sen looking extremely triumphant on uh, one of the fairy islands because she's found some beaver sticks. And not only did we find beaver sticks, which you could argue have been washed up from somewhere else, we also find found plants on those sites that have been cut by beavers that have been visiting there. They tended to be small trees and saplings and there weren't many of them, which suggests animals are just sort of visiting and then going away again. Um, so, you know, you could imagine that in the fairy isles, they may be coming out of the mainland and then bobbing back in again after they've had a look, or they could be passing through on their way to somewhere else and, and navigating by the ocean. So that's really interesting finding for us because it's the first clear sign we've had in quite a long time that the beavers are using some of the saltwater ways to get around. The second thing we found that was quite exciting and that was as the result of a tip off by a local was that there was an awful lot of beaver activity down on the base of the Barnagad burn just before it flows out at Aknamara. Um, and that is a really exciting finding because we've always checked in on the Barnagad burn and we always thought that there was potential for beavers to be resident sort of it's a, it's a huge stream system that goes throughout Mapdale and it, and it ties into a lot of different locks and things and so it was really exciting to see beavers there but the question then becomes who are those beavers that are on Barnagad burn and where have they come from and there's a few different theories that you could have about this so the first um, is that these beavers, so this is a zoom in of the area, and they might have come through um, from the end of the Kulivar outflow into the Fairy Isles, possibly stopping off at the Fairy Isles and causing a few signs, coming around the peninsula, possibly stopping off again and leaving another sign, and then coming in to Aknamara. So that is, that is one thing that could have happened. Um, a second obvious route into that inlet is from Buick. So um, we actually released a couple of new beavers onto Buick uh, back in September. And there are beavers already um, resident between Buick and Lily Lock as well. And so what well, we weren't sure what would happen with those new beavers that we released. Um, and it could be that those beavers have dispersed down the Buick outflow, which had an awful lot of field sign back, um, back in March. There was lots of fresh activity down the outflow and it did sort of look as if they were moving up and down there, possibly making their way down to the sea. 
Um, and from there, it's it's a very easy jump across to Barnagad Burn. And just bearing in mind, these inlets are extremely sheltered, extremely calm, especially on a calm day. It wouldn't be hard for a beaver to navigate that water at all. Beavers are fine in salt water as long as they get fresh water most days. Um, and then the third route, the potential route, is um, that we also released some beavers onto Loch Larrick. Uh, last year for the first time. That was a trial, like we hadn't used the Lar uh, Laric site before and none of the beavers that we put there stayed. So there's currently no sign that beavers have settled on Loch Larrick. One of the beavers unfortunately was, was found dead, washed up at Kilmickle quite soon after the release, but the other three, we don't know where they are. And it is possible that they could have dispersed down the Laric outflow and it could be them that's now in Barnagad. To me, having walked the Larrack outflow and seen that it's a very steep, there's several waterfalls, it's quite difficult to navigate, it seems like the least likely scenario, um, but beavers surprise us all the time and we have a, a pair of beavers that regularly navigate up and down a waterfall um, in a different lock system, so it's not impossible. Um, so that's quite exciting um, and it'd be really interesting to know what exactly is happening down at Barnagad. We know they haven't spread any further up the stream yet towards the rest of the outflow system. Um, and then the other thing to mention uh, is that we have a lot of activity on Buick Pond. So this is a little tiny body of water just north of Buick. And again, those beavers that we released onto Loch Buick last September, it's possible that they could have moved out of Buick and up onto the pond. And there's a, there's a ford that crosses the forestry track just near the pond, and they've dammed near that ford. They've put two small dams in, and the ford and the pond are now one big waterway that you could float a canoe on if you wanted to. It's really impressive what they've done there. Perhaps not as impressive if you're trying to get a forest vehicle across it um, but it, it's it's very cool to see what they've done and again the question is what what beavers are there and we did put some camera traps out onto the new dams uh, that are on um, uh, the ford and we've got a picture of a beaver and we're going to assume that this footage shows the beaver that built these dams and if you look at the footage you'll see that um, it's not really clear who this is. This beaver might be wearing an ear tag in its left ear. I've shown this footage to numerous people and I get about a 50-50 response on whether they think it's an ear tag or not. So it's super unclear. If it's wearing an ear tag, it's one of the new beavers that we released. If it's not, it's it could be either one of the older beavers that's already on Buick or it could be a new beaver that's pulled its ear tag out. So this footage isn't super helpful, but it does show those beavers currently working that system, which is is really exciting. Uh, and then the last thing to note is that there's increased beaver activity on the Coulee Bar outflow uh, towards the Fairy Isles. So the, the, this activity has been building for a while, but it now stretches all the way down the outflow. Uh, and the transformation of that system is, is just really impressive. Um, you used to be able to walk from the forestry track to the burn on dry land. And I took a video while I was there that will show now that just shows exactly how impressive that transformation is. So I'm here in the Knapdale Forest Reserve and I'm standing in amongst some of the best example of beaver habitat modification that we probably have in the Scottish Beavers Project. So this area that I'm standing in now, I don't know if you can see, but I've, I've got to wear waders and I'm kind of up to my waist in water. And this is an area that I used to be able to walk across on dry land to get to the burn that the beavers are using that is just over here. And at this point, what the beavers have done is built so many different dams and canal systems that you can see behind me now, there's a small dam that's created a pond, a kind of little beaver hot tub back here. They've got a stream system that you can probably hear rushing around in the background. And this is extensive. And this is such a good example of how beaver habitat modification creates habitat for other forms of wildlife because Around me in this pond here, not only have we got loads of different water plants growing, we've also got loads of invertebrates and insects. There's great amphibian life in here as well. And if you can just see, it's, it's a super extensive piece of habitat modification. And this is, this is what beavers are all about. This is the ecosystem engineering stuff that we're always talking about. And it is just really so impressive. So yeah, that's just an example of, of some of the amazing work that beavers have done in Napdale, and I know Jill's going to show some of some of that other stuff as well. So just to sum up, uh, in terms of when we finished in September, the, the picture that we have is that the vast majority of the locks uh, in Napdale have beavers on, and in terms of knowing who they are, we don't always know which beavers are where, but thanks to a lot of the camera trapping that ourselves and Heart of Argyle have been doing, we do have a fair idea. So we know we've got a couple of families at this point on Coulee Bar. Uh, we know we've got a pair of beavers that are moving between four locks, uh, Linna, 
Fiddler, Loch Anbeg and Craig Vore up to the north of the system and they just seem intent on occupying all four of those locks at the same time. Uh, we've got a pair that's really well established on Loch Losken, uh, we've got the pair on uh, Loch Anbuick and Lily Loch, and then we've got these pairs where we don't know who they are. There are two beavers who are different from their tail patterns to all the rest that are definitely on the fairy isles together, at least two. Um, there's whichever the beaver is on the Buick Pond, and there's whichever beavers are on the Barnegad Burn, and then Harris and Alba that we know about at Mackay as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's the picture. It's a pretty exciting picture. And I'm now going to hand over to Jill Douse from Scottish Wildlife Trust, who's going to talk about the more of the overall picture throughout the whole um, three year beaver reinforcement project in Napdale. Thanks very much, Helen. Yes, I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about the successes that we've had in the, the Napdale project and the recent reinforcement. So I guess the first question really is why did we decide to reinforce the population at Knapdale? So in 2016, after the successful beaver reintroduction, beavers were allowed to remain in Scotland. Uh, but Knapdale was always intended as a trial site and not as a founding population. And there was beginning to be real possibility that that population would become extinct. But beavers by then had become accepted in the local area and the loss of the species would have been detrimental to the local economy and the biodiversity. So how did we go about doing the reinforcement? Well, the Scottish Beaver Trial Partnership reunited, so that's uh, RZSS and the Scottish Wildlife Trust, formed Scottish Beavers and applied to Nature Scott for a three-year licence under the Scottish Code for Translocation. Uh, we got permission from Forestry and Land Scotland to release animals on their land, and we got the licence to release up to 28 animals throughout the original trial site. So I'm going to talk you through a bit of a timeline after that successful reintroduction project. So after receiving the Beavers in Scotland report from SNA, uh, Nature Scott, sorry, in 2015, the Scottish government decided that animals could that remain in Tayside and Napdale. So in 2017, we got that license um, uh, agreed by the Scottish government. And uh, later that year, we released our first animals uh, into Napdale under the reinforcement project. In May 2019, uh, we were very pleased to see European protected species status granted to beavers across Scotland. In September that year, we uh, uh, confirmed the first beaver kits in Napdale of Bavarian origin that had come directly as a re reinforcement project. And in December, we topped off a very busy year with winning the uh, Nature in Scotland Species Champion Award. In February this year, we commissioned a wider area survey to look at how animals were faring beyond Knapdale. And we confirmed that they're not yet expanding out of Knapdale. Uh, and that's most likely due to the fact that the, the, for the reasons that Knapdale was decided as a trial site. So it has very sort of specific geomorphology that we felt would keep the animals in. Um, so in March this year, we uh, discovered that all available release locations within Knapdale were populated. And so the decision was made that no more releases would happen. Uh, and then the September survey, as uh, Helen has just said, uh, we saw that the beavers were expanding their range from the locks where they were released to into nearby burns within Napdale, which was a fantastic result. So how did we do? So the aims really of the reinforcement project uh, were to release the beavers into the majority of suitable release points within Napdale. Uh, and we're very pleased to be able to say that, that, that we have done that. And we achieved that in March of this year. Um, we were hoping for at least one Norwegian cross Bavarian pairing and although we haven't reached that yet, we are hopeful that it, it might happen quite soon. Now that there's a greater density of animals within the area and uh, we have evidence of them moving between them territories, and undoubtedly the project has boosted the genetic diversity within the area. We have confirmed an additional two pairs established and breed at Loch Mackay and Loch Slinner and Fiddler. And we have a further pair that's formed in Loch Losgan. And the overall population at the moment does stand at a minimum of uh, five family groups, with seven suspected, as Helen said, that we can't always identify individuals, uh, right across the project area from Lina and Fiddler in the north to the Fairy Isles in the south. Uh, yeah, so sorry, so overall we've had a really positive outcome for the project, sorry. 
getting missed up with my slides. Um, to look at the population numbers then, we have released 21 animals in total uh, within the reinforcement project. Four were from captivity and the remainder from Tayside, which were where they were trapped up in conflict areas. 16 animals were released during the previous trial, and it was really a deliberate strategy to release high numbers in a short period of time to increase the density of animals and increase the chances of families mixing. The status chart highlights the high number of animals that with presence are unknown. Um, and Animals only are marked to present when we can identify a specific individual. And with many animals losing tags, it can get tricky to identify them. So hence why we feel that there are 14 animals at the moment in Knapdale, but we can only say uh, exactly which 11 individuals are there. Uh, the fatality rate of 19% over the reinforcement project is significantly lower than the 31% recorded for the trial, and it sits within the expected range uh, for similar reintroduction projects throughout Europe. Uh, the trial had 14 kits uh, between 2009 and 2014, and in the last fifth, uh, three years we've seen 15 kits. Um, but kits, of course, have even greater difficulty in identification because unless they are trapped, microchipped and ear tagged, it's very difficult to, uh, to pick them apart. And although regular trapping was undertaken during the trial period, uh, we've deliberately have left the animals to them much more to their own devices during the reinforcement. So in uh, looking at the do lock, uh, around 1865, we have map um, for, um, pictures that show us the extent of the Dulock and the forestry drain was put in at some point so the water level dropped but when the beavers arrived they put a dam in and uh, put uh, has, there's been some very significant um, water rises in, in the time since then. Um, the two true engineering um, uh, talent of the beavers came to the fore and the team mapped out that changing extent over the water body and uh, we saw a real change in the habitat there. By the end of the trial the beavers made less and less use of the dewlock and the dam was no longer maintained and that resulted in a drop of the water levels once again um, but by 2019 the waters are stabilised. We've got some fantastic footage of the dewlock here from 2013 and an amazing 13,045 square metres of new wetland have been created here. That's the size of 10 Olympic sized swimming pools. And the flooded, flooding amounted in a large amount of standing deadwood, which is excellent habitat for invertebrates, amphibians, birds, bats, plants and fungi, and has greatly increased the local habitat diversity. And in the footage, you can see the floating pontoon installed by Forestry and Land Scotland in order to reroute the circular path around Loch Oliver. This image of the Dulock was taken at the same time as the drone footage, and it really shows off the changes made to the area and the distinct flood, uh, flooded forestry track um, that's uh, running along the bottom of the picture and the viewing platform and rerouted path installed by Forestry and Land Scotland to the left. So looking at the public engagement um, uh, for this, this reinforcement project, over 786 pieces were put together that the combined reach of over 84 million people. That, that we need to note that that includes wider advocacy for the beavers nationally, um, specifically around European protected species status. Uh, we've had articles, we've had BBC coverage on Inside the Zoo and Grand Tours of Scotland's Locks. There's been interviews on BBC Radio 4, BBC Breakfast, Reporting Scotland, BBC Out of Doors and many more. There's been blogs on both the Wildlife Trust and RZS websites, and there's been social media from both partner organisations promoting beavers locally and nationally. And of course, we've held our annual community meeting, including this, our first one online due to the COVID-19 restrictions. So beavers are back, the first ever mammal reintroduction to the UK, and we fulfilled a moral obligation to return a keystone species that we'd lost to human influences. We have left Knapdale population in a much more robust position going forward with greater number of animals, increased genetic diversity, and the very real prospect of a cross Norwegian Bavarian pairing. We will continue to work closely with the cross sectorial Scottish Beaver Forum and deliver advocacy at the national level for a positive future for beavers in Scotland.
Thank you very much. And I'm really happy now to hand over to John Taylor of the Forestry and Land Scotland, who's going to talk about the future of Knapdale Forest. Thanks, Jill. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm John Taylor. I'm the Environment Forester um, for West Region, based out of uh, Loch Gilphead. I've also got my colleague, Philippa. Um, she's online as well, so she'll, she'll deal with any tricky answers at the end. Um, so West Region covers all of uh, FLS land from Campbelltown in the south to Glengarry in the north, uh, Mull in the west and Tyndrum in, in the east. So Knapdale sits quite nicely in the middle of all that. We're responsible for the, the management of our designated sites, um, identifying habitat restoration opportunities from uh, pores and peatland work, and the survey and monitoring of protected species um, to make sure that our operations don't impact on them uh, and beavers have become part of that. So I'm going to run through our past and recent involvement um, with beavers to begin with, and then I'll get to the, the future of beavers towards the end. So the early days, uh, this is one of the, the early beavers uh, with its uh, radio tag, which they, they had in the early days of, of the Scottish Beaver Trial, showing on, on its back end there. Um, so Philippa and I both have a long history with the beavers in, in that day. We were involved in the preparations for the Scottish Beaver Trial uh, in the beginning. Uh, we helped with the original releases and assisted in the monitoring fieldwork. And we've seen them become adopted into our everyday operations and kind of become part of the scenery. Um, initially, we were obviously very cautious about what happened around beaver release sites. We didn't want to do anything that would cause them to disperse unnaturally. Um, but as they've become more established and built secure lodges where they feel safe, um, we've been able to revert back to more no normal levels of activity in discussion with the beaver trial team. This has allowed us to continue with rhododendron control work um, around the beaver locks, which has been very important and a, a long term campaign to get rid of rhododendron from the, the ancient woodland areas um, and to fell a, a neighbouring coop on another lock which has allowed us to begin the process of restoring that, that to native woodland. Um, so there's just a few photos of uh, the practicalities that we've come across over the years. Um, so this one is just a, an indication of uh, beavers felling trees next to paths. Um, a lot of these are from uh, around Bonaluskan area. Um, this one had to be taken off the stump uh, either because it could have fallen onto somebody uh, or because it had already fallen and blocked the path. Um, the, the two large trees you can see, it's a, a, well, it's a single large multi-stemmed willow. Um, this is an indication of kind of felling of, of important species, in, uh, important trees in the area. Um, this one contained a, an example of a rare species of lichen. The photo it was taken at the time when the beavers were still felling it, um, but they left it shortly after that and it remains exactly in that situation today. So we're, we're monitoring the lichen and we'll see how it adapts to um, its, its new position. Um, next one is minor flooding, um, again at Barnluskan. Um, so this was a few years back uh, when the beavers first moved up onto Barnuskan and built a dam on the outflow and we were experiencing the flooding of the path. It also con um, coincided with a period of quite heavy rainfall. We had a really wet end to the summer and the autumn. So as I say, it coincided with the, the beavers peak dam building period in the, in the autumn. So we dealt with this one by notching the dam periodically every couple of weeks. We were just take some sticks out of the dam, release the buildup of water. And we kept that up for a few months, um, a couple of months, November and December. And uh, eventually the beavers kind of accepted it wasn't wanted and, and they gave up alongside the, the natural kind of quieting down in the winter. Um, more recent ones from this year, uh, we had a, a dam in a roadside ditch, which was transferring the water onto the, the road um, and it was beginning to erode the road. So we went in and put in our first flow devices, um, which is the next one. Um, so the idea of these is that they, um, the pipes through the dam release the water, the, uh, the mesh filters at the back, um, protect the pipe so that the beavers can't block the end of it. And the idea is that the pipe is, the entrance to the pipe is so far back that the 
beavers don't really associate it with the, the hole in the dam. Um, we were a bit dubious, even as we put it in, uh, despite it being a, a tried and tested technique in, in the US and other places. Um, and we're a month, month and a half down the line, and they seem to have accepted it. They've, they've not done anything else. Um, so fingers crossed it stays that way. Um, and so it's kind of a win-win situation. The beavers get to keep their, their ponds that they've dammed for tra traveling about and transporting felled sticks. Uh, and we get to protect the road and, and not spend what is public money to, to repair it in the future. Um, so the next, the next picture just shows a, a view from the opposite direction. Showing the, this was the, a pond at the top of the system. Uh, it was three dams um, and the top one wasn't causing a problem, so we left that as was. Um, so moving on to a bit more of the future. Um, so the future of NAPDO forest in general to start with, we're just coming to the, um, the end of one forest design plan period and moving into the next. Um, so this is a map of the, the future species um, plan for Knapdale. Um, more Atlantic rainforest, uh, the Oakwoods have been rebranded the uh, Atlantic rainforest now. Um, so the brown and the pink are areas of native woodland. Uh, the light blue will be productive Sitka concentrated in the, the east and the west um, away from the ancient woodland core area. Dark blue is mixed conifers focusing on species like Norway spruce, Douglas fir, um, more kind of European conifers, which seem to be less invasive and are better for squirrels because they, they cone more regularly than Sitka and produce larger seeds within those cones. And so they'll be quite important as they, they'll fill the, the food gap whilst the native woodland develops. Uh, this plan is going to Scottish Forestry for approval any day now, uh, and the consultation stage is closed, but uh, the maps are still available on the, on the website. Uh, there is a link at the bottom of the screen, but it's it's easy enough to find by the, uh, the Forest and Land um, homepages. You can navigate from there. So finally, uh, my last slide, I'll, I'll get to the point, the future of beavers in Knapdale. Um, up till now, we've, we've just kind of hosted the trial and more recently the reinforcement. Um, so we'll become the custodians of the beavers in that field moving forward along with all the other wildlife. Um, so our executive team up in head office are, are currently looking at the future options for beavers in Napdale based on some scenarios provided by uh, Kenny and I and I would like to say that they're all positive for beavers. Um, so the more in depth we go um, with our involvement the more it costs and as a public body, we're, we're starting to see our budgets understandably reduced um, as the government tries to deal with the, the COVID pandemic and the, the costs associated with that. So that, that may become a, an issue as well. So starting at the top, the, the kind of light touch end is accept the status quo. Um, we accept them as a, a functioning wild population and leave them to get on with it. Uh, we make sure our operations don't impact them on them as protected species, uh, which is exactly the, the approach we have at the minute with badgers, otters, bats, things like that at the minute. The middle ground would be to take this a step forward and be a bit more involved and carry out some population monitoring um, and probably just add a basic level of presence and absence monitoring, which would be similar to what has been done um, since the Scottish beaver trial ended. Um, and similar to what Helen was describing, uh, twice yearly monitoring in, in March and September to assess territories, breeding success, and any expansion or contraction in habitat use. The more intensive end is to accept further translocations uh, from the Tayside population, um, work in conjunction with Nature Scott and potentially OZSS for the, the health screening aspect to check beavers aren't carrying any parasites and things and they're, they're healthy to come and join the natural population. Um, so those are the kind of the three broad options. At the moment, we're happy to say that we're in a kind of a fully booked situation. Um, all the suitable territories are filled and seem to be reasonably well established. Um, the acceptance of other animals would need to be based on the presence of available habitat. Beavers are fiercely territorial and they will fight with any of the incomers uh, that are encroaching on their patch. So for the welfare of both the existing animals and the incomers, 
we've got to make sure that any new arrivals are going into a vacant territory. Um, so I've added a line at the bottom just to say what would people like to see. Um, so there's the, the Q and A box. Um, I guess you can you can put something in there. Um, I'm sure uh, Rory will be taking notes. I hope somebody is. Um, so yeah, any feedback on on what people think should happen to the natural beavers would be would be interesting. So that's it from me. Um, it's kind of a, a quick run through the the history of our involvement, really. Um, over next to uh, Pete Creech from Heart of Argyle Wildlife Organisation. Ah, that's what it says Jenny Bryce. Sorry, on to Jenny. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, I think a slight switch of order there. <laughs> so yeah, my name is Jenny Bryce and I'm part of the wildlife management team at Nature Scott, or what people probably better know as was Scottish Natural Heritage. Um, so um, other colleagues than myself have been much more involved in the work at Natdale over the years. Um, and I, my involvement's relatively more recent in picking up some of the project management of some of Nature Scott's beaver work. So I opted um, to talk about a national overview rather than necessarily um, a national approach, because I think I can provide a bit of an update on where we are with beavers and um, perhaps in the rest of Scotland. Um, and perhaps how we've reached this point. But as we say, in terms of the what happens next, um, a national approach or a national strategy, well, some of that's very much uh, in the development at present. Um, I haven't got any other slides other than this title slide, uh, as I was expecting others would have had lots of nice pictures of beavers. So um, you just have to put up with this one, I'm afraid. Um, so I just plan to provide a bit of a short summary uh, and of course, happy to follow up with any questions later. So again, um, Jill touched on some of this, but in terms of the, the chronology, then obviously there's a lot has gone before in terms of the Scottish beaver trial uh, and also some of the controversy around the unauthorized release of, of beavers in Tayside. Um, but I was gonna start at, this, at the same starting point in terms of the cabinet secretary's decision um, in November, 2016 to allow beavers uh, to remain in Scotland and namely in Tayside and Argyll. Um, and that they should be allowed to expand their range naturally from there. Um, also, just to acknowledge um, the role of the Scottish Beaver Trial in informing this decision and uh, providing a lot of the evidence that went into the, the Beavers in Scotland report. Um, and this evidence was then submitted to the Scottish Government. And I think it's uh, fair to say that on balance, this concluded that um, beavers have the potential to provide positive benefits um, for biodiversity through habitat creation, uh, for ecosystem services, the positive benefits uh, such as flood alle alleviation, reducing soil erosion and improving groundwater storage, as well as bringing positive experiences to people um, through um, wildlife watching um, and also opportunities for people to learn more about nature. Um, and I think on balance, the view was that the benefits uh, could outweigh the negative impacts and hence um, in line with, with that decision. So then there was a period um, primarily working through the Scottish Beaver Forum, which is a forum set up and the members include government organisations, conservation, farming, land management and fisheries organisations. Um, and working together, these organisations have developed um, the Beaver Manager Framework. And that is very much a precursor to them becoming European protected species, uh, which was in May 2019. And again, the fact that all these different interest parties were willing to work together, I think was quite an important part of the decision for them achieving a protected species status. So what does the beaver management framework do? Um, well, it provides the suite of policy and guidance uh, that seeks to try and deliver this balance between delivering these ecological benefits while at the same time trying to minimise the negative impacts that beavers can have on other interests. So it includes policies on beaver licensing, translocations, um, the management actions under a beaver mitigation scheme, um, monitoring research, and also the development of, of projects um, that would further explore some of the, the benefits of beavers. So we're now just uh, one year on from that point in time of them becoming European protected status. Um, and 
um, again, just say one year into a three year mitigation scheme, which is intended very much to trial some new and innovative approaches to try and mitigating some of the impacts of beavers in a Scottish context. Uh, so I think this is pretty much where we are currently, that the um, Scottish Government policy of seeking a natural expansion hasn't really changed, um, but the potential for translocations of animals from areas of high conflict to areas of low conflict within that existing range um, has been recognised. So such releases would require a licence and they would again need to follow the Scottish Code for Conservation Translocations. Um, which includes the need for local consultation, um, particularly with those whose interests are likely to be affected. Um, so that's where we are in terms of that approach. Uh, also just to mention that uh, a repeat survey of the fourth and the tea catchments is now underway. Um, and we're hopeful that this will provide up-to-date information in terms of the current population size and the, and the spread of beavers in Scotland. Um, so through the Scottish Beaver Forum, there is now an interest in developing a national beaver strategy, which could be a little bit more forward looking and it could involve looking at a number of future scenarios. Um, and the hope is that this would be co-produced through the forum. And again, it would reflect uh, the range of interests um, in beavers. Um, but this work is very much at the early stage. So it's difficult to say too much at this point about quite what form that will take. Um, but as John just mentioned, obviously the role of the Natdale beavers would be part and parcel of that, so it would be good to hear um, others' views on, on what that might be. So that's all I plan to say, and um, thanks very much. I'm now handing over to Pete Creech and Ollie Hemmings to talk about wildlife tourism in Natdale. Okay, thanks Jenny. Um, I'm Ollie Hemmings from Heart of Argyle Wildlife Organisation. Our organisation was formed in 2016 at the end of my employment as the education ranger with the Scottish Beaver Trial. Despite the project's formal end, we realised that there was still an increasing interest in the Nafdale beavers. This interest was fuelled by ever increasing uh, beaver exposure in the media and other beaver projects starting up throughout the UK. We ran a year of walks and events in 2016, and then in 2017, we opened the Argyle Beaver Centre. The Visitor Centre celebrates the reintroduction of beavers into Scotland and all the other amazing wildlife that we can find in Nafdale. We've created something that's unique in the UK, a beaver visitor centre where people can get up to date, face-to-face -face information on the Nafdale beavers and their activities. We offer hands-on displays, activities for kids, theme days, and in addition to our popular guided beaver walks, we also run things like seashore safaris, bat walks, <laughs> moth mornings, pond dipping, and much more. I've um, got a few figures to show you now. So um, you can see that since we started, the number of people visiting the centre and attending the walks, talks, and events has increased steadily. Even this year, which has been <laughs> exceptional, and despite the pandemic, the number of people visiting on a daily basis has remained pretty stable, although obviously total numbers have gone down because we couldn't open until mid-July. 95% um, of the folk that come in now are asking about the beavers. That's their core interest. And we've seen that interest rise over the four years since we've been here. Um, we're not just an information centre, though, and we've lost count on the number of times that conversations get triggered um, on the bigger picture regarding Scotland's wildlife habitats, and the role that the beavers have got to play in that, in, in a, a kind of wider real wilding context. Um, uh, and also the beavers are coming increasingly a focus of many visitors holidays here. Um, folk on average spend about 15 to 20 minutes in the centre, um, considerably longer today. <laughs> um, we have engagement, direct engagement with them and it's not a self-led experience. So since we've been open, we reckon those engagements total about 15,000. Um, during lockdown, nobody could visit us, so we went virtual. Um, early spring, so part of my garden pond ended up in a tank in my office. So we filmed the development of frog spawn and tadpoles over the spring, and then we posted the progressive videos on social media. And um, hopefully, some sort of compensation for everyone who couldn't go out pond dipping. Um, we've also always had a, a strong media presence, and during the time that was really important. So a big increase in the number of people interacting with us, getting out there and taking photos. Um, we've got a couple of thousand followers on Facebook, 850 or so on Instagram. 
beaver walks are still our most popular activity. So as once we were allowed out again, but tourism was still locked down, we decided to create a virtual beaver walk, which we aired live, live on Facebook. About 70 folk joined us for the walk, and then there were ongoing hits on the video afterwards. And here's a brief clip just from the end. You can see an old beaver feed station, and we use some of those old sticks to put our tripod on for our camera. And um, we've caught some fantastic footage here, including this heron dealing with a pretty large eel. And this was one of three eels it caught in about the space of an hour, just showing how wonderfully diverse this habitat, and particularly important because eels are a critically endangered species, and this wetland is providing some wonderful habitat for them. And as we walk back now towards Coulivar, and the light's starting to fail, we're lucky enough to see a beaver setting out for the evening and, and looking for a great place to do some feeding. And this is where our walk ends, and thank you for joining us. Um, even before the onset of this pandemic, wildlife tourism services in, in Scotland were under intense pressure. Um, over the past decade, we've lost nearly 50% of rangers in Scotland. Um, it seems clear now that a lot of statutory organisations can no longer have or no longer have the funding or the capacity to offer an ongoing service. Argyll and Butte Council has never offered an ongoing range of service. And we believe that maybe social enterprises such as ourselves will have a critical role to play in the future of wildlife tourism, not just here, but throughout Scotland. Um, within the Mid-Argyll area, our Visit Scotland tourist information have closed, Tarbot, Inverary and Loch Gilpet have all gone. Um, so we not only now provide people with wildlife tourism information, but also act as a kind of ad hoc information point, along with the small centres that are running Loch Gilpad Bookshop and through Kilmarty Museum. Uh, they're the only places in the area where visitors can pick up information. Um, just one example, uh, a slightly damp cyclist walked in last week. Um, it's been very damp the last couple of weeks. He spent some time looking around, asked a few questions about the beavers, but before he left, he tells us he'd never expected to find such a place at the end of a bumpy track that he'd cycled up. He thought it was fantastic to find somewhere to spend some time inside, meet some people who knew the area well, and learn something about the area from them. An experience he wouldn't have gained by just looking at his smartphone. He also wondered, whilst being well-travelled, why centres such as ours were decreasing in the UK, whilst across the rest of Europe they appeared to be on the increase. Um, we think that the service we provide acts as a link between visitors and the local community, but it also provides an opportunity for us to feed back information to other organisations that don't have a presence on the ground in the area. And it's also an opportunity for us to put their side of the story. For example, we champion various citizen science projects. So recently, um, the, the projects led, led by Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels and Sharp Trust, which seem to be of particular interest to folk. Argyle is already a reintroduction and biodiversity hotspot. Greater development along this theme would create further wildlife tourism in the area. All of us, both commercial and statutory organisations, really must work together to ensure that it's truly sustainable, the increase in our wildlife tourism. We already have good partnership working relationships with Carmarton Museum, Wilderness Scotland, and next year we'll be starting working with a new partner, Wild Discovery, hopefully. We've also seen increasingly productive relationships with statutory ag agencies in the area, such as Forestry and Land Scotland and Nature Scott. Visitors these days are looking for a deeper connection with their environment. Experience seems to be the new buzzword. People are looking for something a bit unique. This year, we teamed up with one of our trustees who offers wildlife photography experiences to trial a new idea. He took clients out uh, to photograph the beavers and then brought them into the center where they spent some time reviewing some footage from some of our trail cameras. And they found that seeing the beavers and the other species on the cameras that they interact with fascinating and an insight into the behavior of the animal that they've just been photographing. So at the same time, they felt that they'd contributed to the conservation of the animal by helping with our role of recording the beaver's activities. It was a great success and we intend to repeat that next year when we're able. At the moment, we've got a small viewing window in the center, which gets rather crowded when the red squirrels appear. Um, so we'll be busy over winter setting up a new hide 
which will enable us to run evening wildlife watching events for visitors to observe our badgers and pine martens. Along with all of this, we're also involved in a five-year native oyster reinforcement project that's just begun in Loch Craignish. Although our role here is a teaching role, the site will become a stopping point for visitors interested in marine wildlife. We're so lucky to have so many places in such a small area where people can view such a huge variety of wildlife. It's still early days yet, but we're scoping out the possibility of a future water bowl reintroduction in Napdale. Beavers happen to create fantastic habitats for the bulls, so we hope to be able to add back yet another piece of the biodiversity jigsaw that attract people to this area. We intend to continue keeping a watching eye on the beaver population as it continues to grow and develop, because that enables us to better inform visitors about this amazing creature, and it also helps us to ensure that people don't create unnecessary disturbance, so we can maybe direct people towards areas where they stand the best chances of seeing beavers, uh, get the best experience and um, gently steer them away from other sites which might be a bit more sensitive. When we opened the centre, um, we knew there was a need for what we offer. Um, <laughs> what we didn't realise was how big that need was going to be. We've got two amazing regular volunteers who've made a huge difference to the running of the place and, and the work that we do since they arrived. Nevertheless, we're running at full capacity. Um, realistically, the centre could open for far longer than it is able to do so at present if there was sufficient capacity to do that. Um, we see many future employments for paid employment in wildlife tourism, but are realistic enough to realise that there's always going to be a need for a degree of funding um, to enable any future projects. Um, tourism in Argyll um, accounts for about 20% of its income and it employs more than 20% of its population. And yet, unlike other less well represented industries, it receives little or no subsidy. Um, and we believe it's time that tourism as a whole and the profession that we represent is taken seriously in respect to the contribution that it's making to the economy of this remote rural area. Wildlife tourism, as well as the spin-off benefits to other local businesses, also brings significant physical and mental health gains, has, been more, has also has been very clear this year. We're great believers in, in slow tourism, getting people to spend longer in the area, enjoy a kind of more complete and more holistic experience. And in our opinion, over recent years, there have been a number of very ill-considered tourism schemes throughout Scotland, the vastly increased tourism numbers in areas that don't have the infrastructure to cope with those numbers. We think that following the huge increase in interest in the natural environment developed during lockdown and beyond, that more people than ever are appreciating Scotland's natural habitats. However, this infusion needs to be directed and beavers are and are always going to remain our inspiration. Um, I'll now hand you back over to Sarah Robinson from Scottish Wildlife Trust to field the questions. That's great. Thank you very much. And, and thanks to all the speakers. Um, I mean, I know I'm involved in the project, but I always find it really interesting. And I think the talks have been, been great this evening. So I hope you've all enjoyed those. We've now got an opportunity to ask anyone who's spoken um, a question. So I would encourage you to continue to put your questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screens. We've got a number that have come in already, so I shall direct those to various people. Um, but as I said, keep them coming. Um, and we've got approximately 30 minutes for some questioning now. So uh, one of the first questions, uh, which if I could direct this to Helen Taylor, please, it's do you intend or would you like to conduct any genetic analysis on the beavers? I understand that it will be a real challenge to obtain samples of any kind. You are correct. It was a real challenge to obtain all of the samples that we have. But the good news is that we did obtain lots of samples and we are currently undertaking genetic analysis of the beavers. So we're very lucky because at RZSS we have um, the uh, Wild Genes Laboratory, which is the only zoo based conservation genetics lab in the UK. And the team there have been processing uh, beaver samples from beavers from Norway, beavers from Bavaria, which are the ancestors of the beavers that are in Tayside, beavers from Tayside, beavers from Napdale, and beavers that have been moved from Tayside to Napdale. So what we're building up is a really good picture, genetic picture of uh, beavers in Scotland versus their, their source populations in Europe. 
and what's happening with the mixing into Napdale. So one of the goals of the reinforcement project was to take beavers from Tayside, which are all descended from Bavarian beavers, and pop them into Napdale, where the beavers are all descended from Norwegian beavers. Those are two um, lines that have slight genetic differences. They're not separate species or even subspecies or anything like that. But by mixing them together, we can boost the genetic diversity in Napdale um, and hope for a healthier population in the future in terms of being able to adapt better to future challenges and avoid challenges like inbreeding. So yes, we are doing a, a very um, high resolution genetic study um, to see exactly what results um, our translocations have produced. We want to see what was lost when beavers were brought across from Europe to the UK, to Scotland in particular, and we want to see what's been gained by bringing beavers from Tayside across to Napdale. And those results are actually just coming through at the moment, and I can't really say much about them, but they're all super exciting, and we're going to be publishing them uh, early next year. Thanks, Helen. That's great. Uh, and we've got a few follow on questions there, but I'll, I'll move to another one at the moment. We're getting a few questions in about um, the causes of beaver mortality in Napdale um, and the fact that we'd mentioned that there was a beaver washed upon the shore. Now, they've also asked whether we have problems with beavers being poisoned or deliberately killed. Um, I know that's not been an issue throughout the trial period or the reinforcement. Um, and it's possibly something that's more prevalent in Tayside or was before uh, the beavers were given EPS status. Um, but RZSS have been involved in most of the autopsies of beavers in Scotland. I don't know if Helen Sen, you could provide any insight into the mortality of beavers and any causes that we know about in Napdale. Um, thanks, Sarah. So RZSS does um, do an uh, autopsy on, on all the beaver carcasses that have been retrieved across Napdale. And um, I might have to get Helen Taylor actually to help help me out here a little bit with some of the, the more recent details. But certainly um, a couple of beavers have been um, washed up on the seashore and then and then postmortems have been conducted on them. And there's a you know, possibility that those beavers have 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 died because of um, being out at sea, but there's also other other potential possibilities um, for their mortality. Maybe Helen, do you want to add anything um, in there as well? Yeah, and, and I guess the first thing I would say that is, is in any reintroduction effort, you do expect, unfortunately, to have mortalities, and obviously that's always very sad for us. But as Jill said, the mortality rate for the for the beaver project has been in line with what's been seen in other beaver reintroductions and other reintroductions globally. Um, but with the more recent mortality, the one that I mentioned specifically, the autopsy for that one, and it, it is quite interesting given what I said about the uh, Loch Larrick outflow, um, was that that autopsy suggested that the animal had sustained trauma to the ribs, which had uh, punctured lung and, and caused some internal bleeding, and that that was um, in line with it having taken a fall or some other kind of blunt force impact. Um, and so our best guess is that animal tried to make it down the outflow um, and didn't make it successfully and was washed up at sea. Um, and that is the kind of risks that, that are inherent in, in releasing animals into this landscape. But, but luckily for us, for the most part, that, that doesn't happen. But it tends to be um, when animals are first released, um, if they sort of try and disperse, um, if they're under any kind of stress from trying to disperse too far, um, those tend to be the drivers that we see behind behind mortality and it tends to be often younger and inexperienced animals as well so that animal was um, a, a juvenile that was released with two sisters and a mother um, so yeah that's that's what we tend to see that's great thank you um, we had a question quite early on which which may have actually been answered but just to cover it off um, through the talks, um, it may have been answered. It was around uh, the further intervention or reinforcement in Napdale and whether the population in Napdale is at a level that can self-sustain um, or is capable of dispersing more widely. Now, Jill touched on this in her talk, I know, because we've done that wider assessment in um, Lock up through to Loch Orr. Um, but also you'll have seen from Helen's slides as well that the beavers are moving out, we believe, from areas where we released them. So there's a small amount of localised dispersal. Um, and we, as, as all um, talks mentioned, have filled all the available habitat within Napdale. And I know John and the questions that have come through from Forest Land Scotland are looking into a possibility of reinforcing in the future, but at the moment are going to monitor what's there. Um, and following on from this, the question 
the questioner asked about the Mammal Society having declared beavers in the UK to be uh, endangered on the red list. And um, I wonder if I could ask Jenny to maybe give us a bit of insight on whether SNH is reconsidering its policy of licensing lethal control in relation to this. Unmute yourself. Um, yeah, well, I guess I would say that, you know, this, the assessment does obviously relate to the fact that beavers are relatively recently introduced to Scotland and hence they have you know, come from a small starting point. But we actually think that population is growing from the evidence from the series of surveys that we've done 2012, 2017, 18. And as I say, that survey is, is currently being repeated. So fo hopefully we will get some more information about um, the kind of current trajectory of that population. Um, in terms of the lethal control, I would say that, that we do know there are some situations um, where beavers do cause very real problems for farmers. We've seen examples of where um, damming along drainage ditches leads to waterlogging um, with very significant economic impacts for crops. And also the other particular example is where they're burrowing into flood embankments. And we have seen examples where those embankments have been breached, again, leading to um, significant losses for farmers. And I think these are the sorts of situations that we recognize are currently very difficult to mitigate against. So it's not that we're not exploring mitigation options, but we certainly are, but we recognize that there are circumstances where it's very difficult and hence, you know, there will, we recognize there is a need um, for lethal control under license as a last resort. But I think it's also worth saying that, you know, we are working extremely hard um, with um, Rasheen Campbell Palmer, who now works as a, an independent uh, beaver consultant, uh, and she's working on trapping and translocating to, to other projects. Um, and already this year, since August, we know that 15 animals have been moved from high camp conflict areas through trapping. So, uh, yeah, I think we are definitely trying to, to work towards using trapping more as an alternative. So thanks. That's great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, now we've got a question that I'd like to put to, to Jill, please, which is what criteria do you use for determining success of the project? Um, is it establishing establishment of breeding pairs or number of surviving offspring? Thanks very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so in the reinforcement license application, we stated uh, an, an overarching aim of releasing beavers into the majority of sites uh, within that suitable sites within Napdale. Uh, and as I said in the presentation, that we've done that. Uh, and then the three sort of sub aims, I guess, of that are, you know, having. Um, an additional two pairs breed and establish, and we, we have those, and, and have at least five families, uh, family groups within the Napdale area. And as I said, uh, we've definitely got five. We think we've got seven. It's quite difficult, uh, as we've said, about identifying individuals. Um, and yeah, the last piece of the puzzle it, that we haven't quite got to, but we're so close, it, we, we really hope to have a Norwegian cross Bavarian pairing. Um, but we have, as I said, we've seen a lot of movement between territories, uh, certainly in the last couple of years. So we really hope that that, that will happen soon, especially as they will be sort of dispersing young. Uh, and uh, yeah, as we see that they're moving into the, the uh, streams and, and waterways around and rather than just remaining in the locks. Brilliant. Thank you, Jill. Um, I'm going to try and seamlessly roll a couple of questions together here. Um, so forgive me if it's a bit clumsy. Uh, we had a question in, they're both related gene to genetics. So if I can have Helen Sen on standby. Um, but the second part of one of the questions is around uh, were the, why the Tayside beavers were introduced. And just to give a bit of background to that, it's to say that they were accidentally or slash illegally released. So there wasn't a formal reintroduction program on Tayside um, that's resulted in beavers there. Um, but the initial part of that question and also a related one is about the Tayside population and the different genetic strains. So they were asking around whether the um, Tayside population was a different genetic strain to the one extinct, um, the original British beavers. Uh, from 400 years ago, I assume. But then also there's a wider po uh, question around genetics and the difference between populations. Um, is there just one? 
Great, thank you very much for that question. Um, so in terms of are the beavers that we have now here in, in Scotland different to what was originally um, found in the UK, then we know that that's almost certainly the case. Um, some archaeological evidence has shown that the, 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 the kind of genetic type of beavers that was found historically in, in, in Britain um, isn't really matched anywhere now um, with the, the living um, populations across Europe. Um, but we do know that kind of broadly speaking, they're genetically similar. Um, there's this kind of approximate sort of Eastern and Western division within Europe, within the two, within um, beaver, beaver populations and the, the, the beavers that used to be in, in Britain came from the, from the Western population and the beavers that we have in, in uh, the UK today came Broadly speaking, um, from that from that same Western population, obviously the beavers in Napdale came from Norway, um, which is actually a fairly genetically isolated population. And the beaver, the beavers in Tayside, we know from genetic analysis, um, came came from uh, Germany, from Bavaria. And the Bavarian population is a mixed population um, that was reintroduced itself and has come from a whole variety of different sources of beavers from across Europe. And really the key thing about um, any reintroduction is thinking forwards about how that population will be resilient over time. And a key ingredient of that, not the only ingredient, but one of the key ingredients is that the population has a kind of diverse genetic base so that it um, avoids inbreeding, but also so that um, over time, it's resilient to new challenges that might come along. So things like disease, perhaps, or climate change or other unforeseen circumstances. And the ideal thing really when you're uh, re-establishing a population is to choose a broad founder base. So actually, um, by combining the Norwegian and the Bavarian beavers uh, within Napdale, we're, what we're doing is we're broadening um, that, that founder base. And so that's a hopefully going to be a positive thing in the long term for the population. That's great. Thank you, Helen. Um, now I'm going to field a question towards John and Philippa. So leap in if you, you wish to answer it first. Uh, there's a few here, actually. One was um, saying it was fascinating to see how the beavers have spread out within Napdale. I think that continued beaver monitoring in Napdale is very important. It's such a small population. I hope that there's a plan for future monitoring and it will make the best use of existing knowledge and resources in the area. Um, I'm, and if I could put that alongside um, is there any intention of assisting dispersing out of Napdale to the wider area? Um, John and Philippa, have you any comment on those, please? Um, well, as I say, we're, we're still in the process of uh, formulating our uh, official decision. Um, yes, we are, we are legally duty bound to make sure we're not impacting on them. They are EPS species, the same as, same as otters and bats. Um, so we'll continue to, to kind of definitely, as a, as a minimum, um, carry out surveys ahead of any of our operations that could impact on them. Um, I would like to think we would be able to carry on with some form of, of monitoring of them um, on, a on a most basic level. at. Um, Present absence of, of which locks have the ethers and which ones don't, um, and how they're how they're spreading through that Napdale on the water courses. Thanks for that, John. There is a, a question about: um, Is there a long-term plan to replace Sitka and Norwegian spruce with broadleaf trees? I don't know if you can quickly give us an insight into that. Yeah, we're currently kind of partly way through it. I mean, it started in the mid late 90s um, and into the early 2000s there was quite an extensive uh, amount of uh, conversion from conifers to broadleaves and actually quite a lot of the habitat that the beavers are in at the minute is former um, conifer plantation around the dewlock um, a lot of the birch that they've been eating and felling um, sprang up from conifer plantations being removed from that area so yeah it's a massive long-term um, process um, so yes, that will be continuing. Uh, and as the, the map I showed um, indicated, the uh, the big central swathe of Napdale, which is covered by the Triple S I and the, the SAC, um, will all be going back to broadleaves in time. Um, I mean, 
the, there are still areas where conifers were planted up to kind of five, ten years ago. Um, so they will be allowed to go through their full economic rotation and felled at about 40 years old. So the most recent ones will still be there for 35 years. So um, yeah, we'll be um, converting those back to broadleaf as well in time. Great. Thank you, John. Um, we've got a couple of follow up questions. If I could ask uh, Jenny to respond um, largely around dispersal from Knapdale and into other parts of Scotland. Um, but to, to frame most of them, it's around uh, should more translocations to other areas within Scotland be considered, um, even to enclosed areas to prevent unwanted dispersal? I realise this uh, would need a change in legislation, but there's obviously been some petitions by organisations like Trees for Life for this. Any comment there, please, Jenny? Um, yeah, we can try and handle that one. Um, Thank you. So as I said, there hasn't really been a, a change in the, the kind of government policy from that decision to allow beavers to remain in that that was uh, um, part of that decision was that they would want to see a natural expansion of the populations rather than yeah. necessarily looking to establish new populations. Um, so that's not to say that couldn't happen and I guess we, you know, possibly see those discussions as some way down the line in that there's still a lot of work ongoing in the areas where there are beavers to try and um, develop skills, knowledge, experience to, about managing them um, where there can be issues created. And I guess um, the basis for seeking to establish new populations should really be is because we think they, that would be a good thing to do rather than necessarily just because there are beavers somewhere else that are causing a problem. So um, I, I think I have to say that that's not currently where we are, but that's not to say that at some point in the future that might be um, you know, under consideration. That's great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, just to, to, I guess, answer a few of the questions that have come in as well. There are at the moment just beavers on Tayside and in Knapdale and then as Jenny has described naturally dispersing from those areas there aren't any other um, populations in Scotland at the moment because I think we've had a few questions around where else um, are they or are there any other reintroduction projects out there at the moment and, and at the moment there aren't and um, Scottish the Scottish government are keen that beavers remain within the current uh, area that they exist in and expand out from there naturally. Um, okay, I think we're, we're largely coming to the end of the questions, unless anyone wants to fire in some last minute ones. Um, but if not, um, I will pass over to Helen to close this event. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so just on behalf of myself and Sarah and the whole team at RZSS and the Trust, um, I'd just like to thank you all for attending this meeting. I can see that there's lots of you still hanging on there on Zoom, um, although sadly I can't see you. Um, we've been really touched by the level of local interest and support over the years, both through the Scottish Beaver Trial and the Reinforcement Project. And um, you know, speaking personally, it's been really fantastic to be able to spend time in such a beautiful place and watching the kind of drama unfold for the beaver population grow and change over the year. And, you know, watching the first animals of their kind back in Scotland has been really, really exciting. And it's been a great highlight for me and a privilege. And I know it's probably very much the same for the rest of the team. Um, and I'm sure lots of you as well. Um, I just want to thank all of the panelists for their excellent talks, excellent presentations, and to our project partners, Forestry Land Scotland and Nature Scott, and Heart of our, our, our Wildlife Organisation for their ongoing enthusiasm. And all our funders, and particularly our members and the players of the People's Postcode Lottery, who've provided really generous long term support to this project over the years. And um, we're beavering away now. <laughs> Uh, writing up the project report um, and we really hope that you'll look out for that final report which will come up at the end of the year um, and we'll be we'll be publicizing that on our on our social media channels so thank you very much to you all and and have a lovely evening bye